I want to talk to you tonight about the fatherhood of God. 1 John chapter 3 says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Let's pray together. Father and our God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the incredible love of the cross, the eternal demonstration of your love and compassion for sinners like us. Thank you for crushing your only son in our place where we should have been crushed and where we should have died. Jesus died instead. And so tonight as we talk about your fatherhood, we pray that you just reveal, reveal yourself to us as God the Father and ways perhaps that men and women in here have never experienced. Um, and maybe if they've had a bad father growing up or failed as a father themselves or married a bad father or whatever it may be, Lord, I just pray that your fatherhood would be more than sufficient for them. Help me to preach your word this time. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our country is facing a pandemic, and I don't mean COVID. We're facing a pandemic of fatherlessness. Fatherlessness. There's many reasons for the decline of the United States. I don't know if you realize this, but the United States is declining spiritually, morally, and in many other ways. And there's a lot of reasons for the decline of our nation. But I can't think of any other reason greater than this one contributing factor, and that is fatherlessness. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 17.8 million children in the United States do not have a father in the home. And that's not just biological fathers. 17.8 million children, that's one in four kids, do not live with a biological, a step, or an adoptive father in the home. And that's tragic. What's even more disheartening is those figures don't include negligent and abusive fathers, so it's even worse than that. And today, because of how liberal our culture is becoming, many people don't see this as a problem because, well, all you need is just, you know, one good parent or two dads or two moms, you know, this whole mom and dad dynamic is not as important as it once was, but the statistics actually say otherwise. Listen to this. Research shows that kids raised without a father in the home are at greater risk for poverty and more likely to have behavioral issues. The death rate for infants is higher when dad is not present. Fatherless kids go to prison, commit crimes, abuse drugs uh, and alcohol, drop out of school and get pregnant at higher rates. And that get pregnant at, in their teenage years. Dads are important. I remember sitting in an AA meeting one time and listening to this girl talk, and she was talking about how she became a nihilist. And if you don't know what that is, nihilism is basically atheism, and it's the world has no meaning, and when the world has no meaning, then you just do whatever you want to make yourself feel good, and that's what she did. She uh, just indulged in drugs and sex and alcohol. She just pursued, pursued pleasure, and what she realized was that pursuit of pleasure was destroying her life, and she almost committed suicide before she found recovery. And I was not surprised to hear that she did not have a good relationship with her dad. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that story throughout the years. I've seen countless women come into different ministries, different recovery rooms, and they have indulged in sin. They have indulged in destructive behavior. And nine times out of ten, they have daddy issues. It's why many women go from one man to another. They don't really realize it, but what they're doing is they're seeking the affection dad never gave them. They didn't have a good relationship with dad. Dad didn't treat them the way that they deserve. They didn't get the attention that they crave, and so they seek it out. And the problem is not just for women. It affects men, too. It might actually be worse for men because when men don't have fathers in their lives that they need, um, not only does that turn out bad for them personally, but then they become fathers like the one that they had, and the cycle just continues. Boys without fathers grow up to be men who struggle in countless ways. They have trouble developing emotionally and intellectually and spiritually. They don't know how to deal with problems. They have lower self-esteem. They're more prone to laziness and excuses and, of course, drugs and alcohol and crime. But they also have trouble with relationships, both with friends and with the opposite sex, because they haven't seen a model from dad. Most of the men I've discipled in recovery 
have had bad fathers or no fathers at all. And one man stands out in particular, his name was Brian. Brian was mean. Brian was angry. He was a drunk and he still is. Um, He had bad relationships with his family and his friends and especially his wife. And I was not surprised to hear that Brian did not have a dad growing up. I'm sure there's a lot of Brian's in this room tonight. Either you feel like Brian or Brian was your dad or whatever it may be. You could just fill your name in those stories and that would be that would be your story. Maybe dad wasn't present, or maybe he was and he was abusive, or whatever it, the story is. Um, the problem with fatherlessness is just astronomical. The the consequences just reap destruction upon our lives. And and so what we need is redemption. What we need is is an opportunity to recover and to, to see a vision of God. The remedy for the soul is the vision of God, and the remedy for fatherlessness is a vision of God the Father. If you grew up without a father, don't have a father now, or been a bad father, or, or ladies, you married a bad guy, or kids don't have a good father, what you need is to see God in heaven as your father, one who will care for you, one who will never leave you, never forsake you, and that's what we want to do tonight. I want to talk to you about God the Father. And the Bible talks about God as our Father in four different ways. First of all, God is the Father of all creation. And what I mean by that is that, and we'll talk about this in a moment, Christians are the sons and daughters of God by adoption. But there is a sense in which all of creation belongs to God, and God is our Father by virtue of creation. In Acts 17, Paul tells the Greek philosophers that we are God's offspring because he made us. And Luke's genealogy of Jesus, Adam, the first man created, is referred to as the son of God by virtue of his creation because he didn't have an earthly father. God was his father. In Job, spiritual beings, so angels and even demonic beings, are referred to as the sons of God. So there's a sense in which God is a father because he made us. Secondly, God is the father of the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel. So God is the father of all creation, but as the story of Scripture progresses, what we see is that God sets apart a nation, a people for himself, and he calls that people his son. He calls himself their father. In Isaiah 63, verse 16, Isaiah says, For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from a mold is your name. Isaiah 64, 8 But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are the work of your hand. And then, referring to the Exodus, he says in Hosea, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So God was a father to the nation as a whole, which is really important, because individual Jews did not call God their father. They called him God or Lord. But the nation as a whole referred to God as father until the coming of the Lord Jesus. And that's the third way in which God is father. So God is father by creation. He's a father to Israel. But he's also uniquely the God and father of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus shows up on the scene, he's not only referring to him as God and Lord. He primarily refers to God as my father. And he speaks about God in very personal ways. He'll say things like, my father is with me. Or my father is a witness to me. As if it's this person that he's been conversing with. He speaks about God in these very intimate ways. And people were kind of tripped up by that because no one called God their father. And some may argue, you know, well, yeah, God's the father of Jesus, but God's my father too. What's the difference? In fact, before I was a Christian, I got pulled into a conversation with these guys that were arguing about that. And they, this, I remember this guy said, you know, yeah, Jesus is the son of God, but I'm the son of God too. I remember I was not a Christian. I just said, that doesn't sound right, you know. And what he's trying to say is, is that Christians are, we are the sons and daughters of God, but Jesus is the unique son of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God, which means because Jesus is eternal, Jesus eternally proceeds from God. Jesus eternally comes from the Father. He has the exact image, the exact nature, the exact characteristics as God the Father. Just as a son has the same characteristics as his father because he's his offspring, Jesus is the offspring of God. Doesn't mean he's created because he's eternal, but it does mean that he is the exact representation of God the Father. 
And the Jewish opponents of Jesus knew this. Listen to this from John 5, 18. They were seeking to kill Jesus because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So in, in Jewish thought, this, this doesn't really make sense to us because this is not how we think. But in Jewish thought, if you called someone your father, you were essentially saying, I'm exactly like that person. So if you were to say, you know, Obadiah is my father, you're claiming to be equal with Obadiah. You're claiming to have equal status, equal characteristics because you're father and son. So when Jesus came on the scene and he was saying that God is my father, Jesus was claiming equality with God and they knew that and they wanted to kill him for that. His relationship with God is eternal. In John 17, he says this, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And then he says this, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus claims that God is not only his father, but they have this relationship that predates the creation of the world, which means they have always been father and son, the eternal father and son, and they have an intimate relationship. And this is why the God of Christianity is the only God that can be a God of love. I've been talking to a Muslim man here recently, and we're having great conversations. He and I are actually going to have a debate here at the church um, on August 10th, and we're going to debate Christianity. We're going to debate the deity of Jesus, and one of the points that I may or may not make is that the God of Islam, Allah, cannot be a God of love. He's not a God of love. Why? Because Allah, as a singular person existing in eternity, had no one to love, had no one to interact with. He was by himself. He had to create in order to demonstrate love. Whereas in Christianity, the one true God, because Allah is not a God at all, the one true God has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before anything else was created. And so they existed in a community of love. This is why we can say that God is a God of love. He didn't become a God of love. He's always been a God of love because the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. And this is how they function in salvation. As I was saying before this message began, it's the father who sends the son. It's the son who dies on the cross. The father did not die on the cross. The son dies on the cross in the place of sinners. And it's the father who crushes the son out of love for sinners who should have died in his place. So he's the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which leads us then to this fourth point. He's the father of all Christians. So it's... it's, true that God's the father of all creation but it's also true if you're not a Christian you're a spiritual orphan you're not a child of God in fact the Bible says you're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil you're a child of our God and father or you belong to Satan and so when Jesus told his disciples and they asked him how to pray and when he taught them how to pray he said this pray like this our father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name. When you pray, Jesus said, you can address God as Father because you trust in me. And this is because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus died for our sins, was raised from the dead, we have now, who have trusted in Jesus, have been adopted into the family of God. God doesn't have any biological sons apart from Jesus. All God's sons and daughters are adopted into his family. He also doesn't have any grandkids. So if you're banking on your parents' faith, that doesn't work that way. God has adopted sons and daughters into his family. John 1.12 says, To all who did receive him, who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God is what we are. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God makes us his children. He adopts us into his family. This is why Christians, and this is why our church, has an adoption ministry. This is why Christians all throughout history have cared for orphans, have cared for children. Yes, because it's the right thing to do, but also because God has adopted us into his family. We're just paying back the favor. We're taking care of children who need help because God took care of us and made us his children. And Paul says that we can call God Abba which when translated in a few different ways can mean things like daddy. That's how close of a relationship we get to have with God. And as we read just a moment ago, he's a loving father. See what kind of love the father has given to us. 
that we should be called children of God. What a privilege that we are God's children. And so because of God's fatherhood and because of what he's done for us in Christ, we can live a certain way. We can live with father wounds. We can live as better dads, better parents. We can get into relationships that are more beneficial than the ones we have before in the past because God is our father. We have an example to look to, which means that our lives can be different than what they were before. And so that's what I want to talk to you about for the remainder of our time. Is how does this idea of God as Father apply to our lives today? And I'll give you four things real quick. Number one, this is for our guys, become the Father that you wish you had. Become the Father that you wish you had. I know probably many of you did not have good fathers growing up, so you didn't have a good example. But God, through Christ, is our Father, the perfect example. And you can become the father, like God, and the father you wish that you had. Fathers are much happier. Fathers who are involved in their kids' lives, research shows, are healthier and happier men. Listen to this. The data shows that involved dads show greater signs of being satisfied with their lives. They have better physical and mental health. They live longer. They have less depression. And they have an increased self-esteem. Involved dads are less likely to use drugs and abuse alcohol. They have better marriages and stronger families. You know why the data shows this? It's not just because it's true, but it's because when you live according to God's design, you flourish. And that's why, that's why our lives have seen so much wreckage and carnage is because, not just because we were sinning, but that's true, we're living, a court, or we're living in a defiance to creation order. When you live in defiance of your creator and you don't live in the way the creator has designed you to live, then things will malfunction. Things will go wrong. But when you live according to creation design, you're a happier, healthier person. So just real practically, how can you become the dad you wish that you had? Guys, the most important thing you can do for your children is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The most important thing you can do to be a good dad is to be a faithful Christian. Be a man of prayer. Be a man of the word. Be a man who's committed to worship, to building his church. Most importantly, be a man who loves Jesus. Be a man who loves the Lord. 99% of problems in the home with fathers is because fathers are selfish. It's selfishness. Jesus teaches us self-denial. The reason dads walk out, the reason they choose their sin is because they're choosing to please self. Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. You know what that looks like practically? It looks like when you get off work and you want to be by yourself and you want to go do your own thing or it's the weekend and you want to just please yourself, you crucify your desires if that's what is necessary and you serve your family. Men are selfish creatures. I say that as one who has a lot of experience with that. But Jesus teaches us to love others the way that we love ourselves, to think of others before ourselves. He teaches us to lay down our lives for our children and for our wives, to train our children in the fear of the Lord and to disciple our wives in the ways of Christ. That's how you can become a good dad to your children. Secondly, and this is for the ladies, Marry a good man who will become a good father. Marry a good man who will become a good father. Ladies, I know some of you, maybe many of you did not have good fathers growing up, didn't have a good example to learn from. And to compound that pain, your kids now don't have a good father and that makes it even more difficult. Let me encourage you, if you're a single woman, to marry a man who loves the Lord so you can break that cycle. That is how you break the cycle of fatherlessness and father hurt is by finding a man who will become a good father to your kids. Because it's not only good for kids, I've shown you a lot of data tonight, I'm gonna show you some more. It's not only good for kids when dad is involved, it's good for the mom too. Listen to this. Research shows that involved dads produce moms who are more likely to receive prenatal care less likely to smoke or abuse drugs and alcohol during pregnancy. They produce mothers who have 
children who are healthier at birth. There are moms who are less prone to depression and anxiety after the baby is born. Once the child is born, families with dads involved have women who have less stress and greater satisfaction in their life and in their marriage. And this shouldn't surprise you that when you live according to God's design, you flourish. You flourish. And so how do you find a man who will be a good father to your kids? Well, I don't mean to repeat myself, but the most important thing is what? Find a man who loves Jesus. That's the most important thing you can do. Find a man who is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Find a man who loves Jesus more than he'll ever love you. Because if he loves Jesus more than he ever loves you, then you're going to have a good family. Stop looking for guys to just have a good time with. Stop looking for guys to just hook up with. Stop looking for guys who just look at you a certain way or say certain things to you to make you feel good. You need to be objective in your search. You need to look for men who love the Lord their God and who will be faithful to the Lord their God because that is evidence they'll be faithful to you. It's it's a fact that a man, a man is not called to be the head of his home. He is the head of his home. This is not something he aspires to. This is something he is, whether he's a good one or he's a bad one. So here's Here's the reality. If you have a man in the home or a man in your life that is leading you towards worldliness and sin, then you are going to reap the corruption of worldliness and sin. But if you have a man in your life who leads you towards the things of Christ and righteousness and truth, then you're going to reap the benefits of that. Whether you like it or not, whether this goes against your, your, maybe some feminism that could be in the room, here's the reality of the matter is that men in their families' lives, in your lives, will uh, chart the course for the family's future. They will determine the family's future because men are leaders. They lead their homes and they're either a good leader or they're a bad leader. The question isn't whether they're a leader. The question is what kind of leader are they? And so you want a man who loves the Lord their God so they'll lead your family in ways of righteousness. This third one is a little tough, but it needs to be said. I want to encourage you, if you need to, to forgive your father. To forgive your father. Now, if you're someone who's already worked through these issues, I don't want to bring up old wounds. You can just rejoice in the Lord that you've already worked through this, and this has been a point of healing for you. But maybe you're someone in here who's never forgiven your father. You've never dealt with that aspect of your past because it's so painful But as hard as forgiveness is, you need to understand that it's the only thing that's going to heal your wounds. Time does not heal all wounds. Time may make them a little bit easier to deal with, but time does not heal all wounds. What heals wounds is the grace and mercy of Christ. And the way we receive the grace and mercy of Christ, at least in areas like this, is we have to forgive those who've hurt us. This is why working through the steps is so important. This is why going through your inventory is so important. Because I would put money on it, that nine out of ten of you, when you came to your resentment list, the top names at the list are who? Mom and dad. Those are the first names that people write every single time because those are the people in your life that have the most power. And so you need to work through these things and work through the past, and then you need to sit down with somebody and confess those things and work on forgiving that individual. That's the way you begin to heal. Jesus said forgiveness is essential. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Forgiving others is not how you earn salvation, but it's evidence that you have it. So if you don't forgive, if you're unwilling to forgive, it shows that you don't know the forgiveness of God. And Jesus told a parable about that. Jesus was teaching his disciples about forgiveness and basically said that, you know, you need to forgive your brother. Anytime your brother sins against you, you need to forgive them. And it just kind of struck a thought in Peter's mind like, hang on a second. How many times do I have to forgive forgive my brother? Seven times, which was for them just infinite amount of times. And Jesus responds, no, I tell you 70 times seven, which means every single time someone sins against you and asks for your forgiveness, you need to forgive them. And that was really hard for the disciples to hear. And so Jesus tells this story about a king, and this king who represents God 
had a servant who owed him 10,000 talents, the Bible says. Talents was a, a measure, a financial measure of how much money someone had. And so modern day terms, it's debated, but a, a conservative number would be a little over a billion dollars. The servant owed the king a billion dollars, which was an unpayable debt. That's the point. The point's not the number. The point is that the servant could never pay the debt. And so he's pleading for mercy because the king's about to throw him and his family into prison. And he pleads for mercy. And the king, actually, he just forgives the debt. Says, you know what? I'm just going to wipe that debt clean. You can go free. That's an amazing story. But then the story turns and it shocks us because then that same servant who has forgiven the debt goes out and he finds one of his servants who owes him, I think, a few hundred, let me see if I wrote it down, a hundred denarii, which was like about $5,000. Not a small piece of cash, you know, not a small pocket change, but nothing even compared to what the king forgave this man. And when he finds his servant who owes him a few thousand dollars, he chokes him and demands that he pays him. And when the guy can't pay him, he throws him in prison. And the king hears about this and he says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt I had mercy on you, and then you went out and you wouldn't have mercy on someone who owed you a lesser debt? And Jesus says this, In anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This parable is not about money, it's about forgiveness. And the idea is really, really simple. God has forgiven us a massive debt in Christ. Our sin is like that billion dollars we could never pay because our sin warrants death. We owe God a death because we took from God our lives to be our own. We sinned against him and the penalty for sin is death physically and then eternity in hell and that is something you cannot pay. And so what God has done is he has sent his son to pay that debt for you. That debt has been settled at the cross for you if you put your trust in Christ. And for those of you who have trusted in Christ, God has wiped away your debt. You do not owe God anything because Christ Jesus paid the debt for you. But here's, here's what that means. It means that you have to forgive others their debts against you because their debts against you don't even compare to your debts against God. And God is saying this, how dare you withhold forgiveness when I have forgiven you so much? That's how we forgive people. That's how Christians forgive. We don't just look at the letter of the law. Jesus said, forgive, okay, I'll forgive. We look to the cross. The cross is where we set our eyes and that is how we forgive others. I see that Jesus died and I see that he paid my debt. Therefore, I can forgive any sin that's done to me because it doesn't even compare to the sin I've committed against God. And so tonight, you need to understand that that includes your father as well. And maybe during our time of prayer, maybe after this, you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to just take time to ask God to help you forgive your dad. Well, there's one last thing I want to share with you, and that is to encourage you to embrace God as your father in heaven. Embrace God as your father in heaven. This is the good news of the gospel. The gospel is multifaceted and Guys like me, we love to talk about it. You know, there's things like regeneration. That's not just the name of this ministry. It's actually something God does in salvation where he regenerates our heart and our minds. He fills us with his spirit. He grants us repentance and faith. God justifies us. He sanctifies us. He's gonna glorify us. There's so many different aspects to salvation that we love to talk about. But all those, you could argue, are a means to a greater end. That greater end being that God becomes our father. So the reason we get forgiven, the reason we get justified, the reason all of these wonderful works of salvation take place is so that we can have the greatest reward, and that is God himself. God becomes our father through Jesus Christ, and he's the father we need. He's a father who'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never do you wrong. He'll never lie to you. He'll never not fulfill his promise to you. He'll always keep his word. And even when you go through times of suffering in this life, you can know that whatever touches your head, whatever pain and suffering you endure, your heavenly father has approved of it. He's approved of it not because he wants to harm you, but because he's disciplining you, he's teaching you. He will never do you any harm. The other night, my daughter 
she asked me if she could buy a tent for her room, which we had one in the past, didn't work out well. Now she wants another one. She said, I'll use my own money. I'll use my own money. She always says this all the time, and I end up usually just paying for it, and she never pays me back. I'll use my own money. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll let you buy that. But first, you have to finish your gospel book. She's in the process of being baptized. And one of the things we do for our kids here is they have to finish this gospel book. It's like 40 or 50 pages. a lot of reading. It's a lot of writing. And I said, you have to finish your gospel book, and then I'll let you buy the tent. And she was mad. She was disappointed. She was sad. She started to throw a little bit of a fit. And she, she straightened up pretty quick. But, you know, it, it hurt her. And I did that to her, not to hurt her. I disciplined her because I love her. And that's what God does for us. God disciplines us because he loves us. He cares for us. He provides for us. Jesus said, if you want to know how much God cares for you, just look to the birds. Next time you're outside, look at the birds. They don't worry about a thing. They have everything they need for shelter. They have everything they need for food. And Jesus said, it's because your Father in heaven cares for them. How much more does he care for you? There's this poem that's really good by Elizabeth Cheney. It's called Said the Robin to the Sparrow. Listen to this. Overheard in an orchard, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious humans rush around and worry so. Said the, robin to the, said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and for me. Look to the birds, Jesus said. They don't worry, they don't toil, and they have food every single day. How much more does God care for you? And God will care for you when you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. He'll be your father in heaven for all eternity. You'll never be an orphan or alone. And those father wounds that you have, whether it's the fact that you've had a bad father, you married a bad father, or you've been a bad father, those wounds can be healed through Christ. Those wounds, that forgiveness is all possible because of what Jesus has done for you. And one day, when Christ returns, we're going to live in glory with our Father in heaven. Where There will be no more tears. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more fatherlessness. We'll live with our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Let's pray together.